This program was paid for by Water of Life Church. From Water of Life Ministries in Plano, Texas, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is speaking through his servants to the world. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying today. Let us join Doyle Davidson and others of Water of Life, sowing the Word of God in spirit and in truth. Hello, I'm Doyle Davidson, servant and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, ministering locally to the body of Christ in Dallas of Fort Worth, Texas, sent by God to your house to declare to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, tells us what the gospel is. How that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day, according to Scripture. Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Most he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, set me to heal the broken hearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recover sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised. The word is neither even in your heart nor in your mouth. It is a word of faith which I preach if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. There's a power of God unto salvation. Everyone that believes it. The Jew verse, and also to the Greek, there is a righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by his faith. Well, I welcome everyone to this broadcast, receiving it on live stream, Roku, Apple TV, and YouTube. These programs that we're doing daily will be permanent on my website, Roku, and Apple TV. Jerry Brown is on set with me now. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning, Doyle. After we talk, uh, Kathy D. will come and do the last half of the program. These programs, no one has ever heard because they've never been done. You're going to hear things about me that haven't been told in 40 years. Oh, I'm sure you think they're great sins. Ha ha. Wait till you hear them. We'll see how you love them. Terry is going to read from Hebrews 6, verse 1 and 2, maybe 3. Would you do that? Yes. Hebrews 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permit. Amen. In June 1970, at Argyle, the Lord had led me out there into the wilderness to try me, humble me, and so forth. A young man and his wife came from Florida that we knew, and I was talking to my, his name is Mike Reed. I said, Mike, where is the foundation? He said, no, don't you know? Well, no, I don't know. He said, Hebrews 6. I had read that many, many times, but I didn't know. I, I couldn't see it, but God wanted Mike to tell me. And sure enough, he did. I started studying uh, those doctrines immediately. And interesting enough, my great grandfathers, about seven or eight of them, taught those doctrines in Rhode Island when they were the Rhode Island founders. And here, 1973, I started studying them. You didn't know they 
taught that, did you, until what, 2009 or 10 or sometime? Probably or 11? 10 or 11. Uh -huh. Right. Very interesting. Very much so that Samuel Gordon, uh, my ninth great grandfather, uh, we got a hold of a book and then a bunch of that in them. And Kathy D read it to me. Thank God I've never been able to see it. My eyes have been under a lot of attack for a long time. Also, Terry, I would like you to read uh, Acts 26 about my ministry. All right. Uh, let's start in verse 13, just set up the situation. Right. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. This is Paul speaking here shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Amen. Thank you, Terry. I am an apostle. I am, an, am a prophet. I was a prophet and teacher before I became an apostle. And not by the will of man, certainly not my request, but by the will of God sent to the world. First Corinthians 12, 28 says, God sent first, has sent first in the church Apostle. Secondarily, prophet. Thirdly, teacher. It has not changed. It never will. I'm an apostle, prophet, sent with the doctrine and with the anointing the apostle Paul had and the ministry of the apostle Paul. There's no question about it. You can debate it and you're a fool. If you're wise, you'll humble yourself and accept and let God minister to you the ministry that I've sent. The reason I say you're a fool, I certainly wouldn't, but God is the one that said it. He knows I've been preaching this gospel in America public since 1974 and on radio, 1981, television, 1984, and America has basically rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, by ministry, I'm anointed to preach the gospel, and that is what I do. And the first thing that anointing of my preaching is going to do it's going to open your eyes. Open your eyes to see the Word of God. You see, unless God opens your eyes, you won't ever see it. I know that is contrary to religious preaching, but I don't really care about religion. I once said, I wouldn't give a quarter for religion. I think that's too high. Thank God. So, open your eyes. Turn you from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to God. That you receive forgiveness of your sins. And that you receive the inheritance among the sanctified ones 
that are given to you or you're set apart by the faith of Jesus Christ that is in me. I try to think. Let's talk. Uh, before we go to Hebrews 6, let's talk about this ministry a little bit. Well, I'd like to just comment about that Acts 26 because, um, I mean, I'd read the book of Acts many, many, many times, but it's just really been in the last couple of years that um, the, to see this, if you look back in Acts 26, verse 16, the purpose that Jesus appeared to Saul was to make him a minister, and in verse 18, to open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. I was raised in a religion that, mis well, a couple of different denominations, actually, uh, but they uh, basically just said, all you got to do is say, forgive me, Lord, and you're forgiven. And then I came here in 85 and I began to hear the gospel and got a, a, a deeper, uh, really, understanding or revelation of what was accomplished for me on the cross and that Jesus carried every one of my sins in his body on that tree and that he went to hell and took the punishment that I deserved. So while there's a deeper understanding of that, until you can really see, until God opens your eyes to see that you can believe that gospel, you can know that gospel and believe that gospel, but you have to have an apostle ministering to you, doing these things stated there in verse seven, uh, 18 in order for you to receive that forgiveness. Amen. You can't receive it on your own. You have to have this ministry of apostle. Now, I know people hate that. People hate that they have to depend upon an, uh, uh, their, it's dependent upon an apostle, but that's what this word says. Well, they reject that. Sure they do. The world mm -hmm. uh, has set pastors mm -hmm. in the church. Well, a pastor is not first unless you have an apostle and prophet. You don't have a church. And that I've taught for 40 years. You don't have a church. One of the most bizarre things I heard of in the seventh. Now, we have uh, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. But now, we have to restore apostles and prophets. Look, the church does not have a pastor, a teacher, or an evangelist. That is the heart of God. No way. They come out of the heart of an apostle and a prophet. And I am that, and I boldly tell you that I will not contend with you, but you're foolish if you don't consider what I say, and that's got to give you understanding. Second Timothy 2 7. Open your eyes, huh? You want to say more about that? Well, sure. I've had situations these last couple of years, I mean, you've prayed for me off and on throughout nearly 24 years. But these last couple of years, there's been a deeper work going on. And there have been times that the Holy Spirit would show you certain things or just by your understanding of the Lord from having walked with God for 40, however many years it is now, you would see certain things and, and speak to me and I just couldn't see it at all. And then as you continue to pray and, and deliver me or talk to me, minister me by the Spirit of God, one day it'd be like the veil would just lift from my eyes and I could see uh, what you were talking about, things in my life or things about other people or the groups I'd been associated with. Um, and then once, once I could see it, it was so plain, so clear. But it took uh, the ministry by the Spirit of God through your heart, delivering and ministering, speaking the, the word of God to me um, to, to open my eyes. And it's 
it's really, if you can humble yourself and realize what this verse says, verse 18, it says, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. I mean, that's frightening. If you consider all, and there's, there's some of us around here that have a lot of understanding of this gospel. We could tell you a lot of detail about what was accomplished for us on that cross, but you can't even receive it unless you have this ministry from the apostle going on in your life. And I thank God that he's been doing that with me. Certainly my eyes have been open to my own life, my own things in my own heart, my own intentions. Sometimes I would say, no, I didn't intend to do that. Well, you know, after a while, I found out that was the intent of my heart. And it's the mercy of God to have be working that in my life. Amen. Thank God. In the book of Acts 16, I think, God opened the heart of Lydia mm -hmm. so she could attend unto the words the Apostle Paul taught. God has to open your heart to attend to my words. See, if you reject my words, you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting God. It doesn't matter to me. I can't do a thing for you. Jesus Christ uh, is the one that died and was buried and rose again the third day. I didn't. Thank God. I've suffered much because of my ministry. But uh, hallelujah. And the words that you speak, their spirit and their life, because it's Jesus in you. We're not talking about Doyle, the man, his flesh, his ability. We're talking about Jesus in you and the grace of God that labors through you. Uh, I mean, this verse 18 in Acts 26 says that we are sanctified by the faith that is in me. That's Jesus in Paul doing those things. Jesus in you, the words you speak, their spirit and their life. And that's what cleans us. Jesus told his apostles, you're clean by the words which I've spoken. And likewise, that is a work that you do, Jesus in you does in us. I've had times even that I've thanked you for your prayers. And you'd say, don't thank me. It's Jesus in me that that's right. prays. That's right. And uh, I'm beginning to really get that, I think. <laughs> it's Jesus in me. And Jesus crucified in me. Amen, amen. And Jesus crucified in me. He was raised from the dead. That's who lives in me. That's who lives in you. If you receive my gospel and my anointing and the power of God as I preach. Amen. One more verse I'd like to comment on, John 15. About Jesus being the vine and bearing fruit. Um, I think I really just saw this recently. A couple of months ago, you were talking about it one day. And, you know, we don't just hear, when I say we, I'm talking about those of us that are listening, hearing to the messages being preached here, the gospel that Doyle has preached for all these more than 40 years. Um, we don't hear this gospel and just become fruit. Amen. Jesus is the one that is the vine and he started with Doyle and then Jesus in Doyle bears fruit in us. You, you can't just become fruit on your own. I, that's just something that I really just saw more clearly. You know, when the Spirit of God um, reveals the thoughts of your heart, what you're thinking, how you're thinking this way, you're thinking... Terry, or that you can just believe this gospel and come, become fruit. No, you can't. It's Jesus working through his apostles, through his prophets, um, laying the foundation of Jesus, but uh, we're becoming fruit through that ministry. You don't become it on your own. I believe it's John 8, 31, 32. Many Jews believed on Jesus. Yes. He said, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. May I read that? Sure. Uh, then said Jesus, now start in verse 30 of John 8. As he spake these words, many believed on him. 
Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. You have to continue to be a disciple That's for it. the truth right. to make you free. Being born again, no, that doesn't make you a disciple. Well, I'll throw this in right here. When I first came here in 85 and I heard you say that salvation was a process, right. that was almost anathema to me from my <laughs> religious background. Uh, now, being born again is a one-time experience, but that's not all there is to salvation. Salvation is a process being saved, spirit, soul, and body. Uh, Paul talks about that. I, I don't know. You probably know where it is, but where he prays that we be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body. That yeah. doesn't happen in one instant when you're born again. Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. But um, certainly salvation it is you can be born again, and then your process begins of being saved, being made sound, being made whole, being delivered, being healed. Um, spirit, soul, and body. You have some testimonies that I ask you to consider sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, one about Melton Green. Oh, yes. Another, uh, maybe you don't want to say it, but a, another church in the Metroplex. Sure. I don't mind speaking any of that because I appreciate what God has done in my life. And if God will use my testimonies to open your heart by the Spirit of God, I thank God for that. Just but, a minute. Sure. You were born, born in Austin. I was born in Austin while my parents attended the University of Texas in Austin. And I was born right before their senior year. And uh, they, they had met previously at a junior college, married before their junior year. I was born before their senior year. Upon graduation, they moved to the Dallas uh, area to Dallas and both got jobs here. My mother was a school teacher teaching home economics. My dad was a computer programmer. He worked for several different companies over the years for, for the first early years. When I was three, they bought a house in Richardson, which is still Dallas County, and then I was raised in Richardson. We attended all uh, until I graduated high school. We attended the Methodist Church there in Richardson. I was born again, but not from the teaching there at the church. That was not really something we heard ministered there. But my mother led me to the Lord to be born again. And um, then right about the time of my high school graduation, they began attending a Bible church. And they and we attended a Bible church for the next 12 years. Well, uh my mother had been baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, in her house, all by herself, reading the scripture. And after we went to the Bible church, they said that that was of the devil. So it scared her. She, of course, did not want to follow the devil. Who wants to follow the devil if you know you are? Now, all of us have followed him until God brings you the place to see the truth. But um, so she quit speaking in tongues. And so for years there, um, I have to say this. I can't mention Bible church without the verse in 2 Corinthians 3 where Paul talks about being made an able minister of the New Testament, not of the letter which kills, but of the Spirit which ministers life. Uh, you can be taught the New Testament by the letter and it actually minister death to you and kill you. And when I came here, there was one day, we'd only been here a few months, I was sitting right over here, and you read that verse, and God opened my eyes, and I saw we left Methodist Church wanting more Bible teaching. We went and heard all this Bible teaching, and yet they didn't even have the Holy Spirit, and they ministered the New Testament by the letter and ministered more and more and more death to us. Shut up the kingdom of God. Wouldn't go in themselves and shut it up to us. You find that in, um, what, Matthew 23, I believe. Jesus told the Pharisees. And when I came here, it didn't take too long till I saw we were in a church full of Pharisees. And in fact, our Bible church, I've written this and spoken this for years, our Bible church was the Pharisee of the Pharisees because we were more adamant about 
teach in that New Testament. And one more thing I've got to add here. Just because you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you take this word and teach it, does not mean you're ministering it by the Spirit of God. Amen. You have to be led by the Spirit, speaking words in obedience to the Spirit of God in order to minister it by the Spirit. You can't just take this word and preach. You'll right. be in the flesh. So anyway, uh, with that background, um, uh, we hit some problems in our life, some difficulties, and we began some seeking the Lord. And uh, we had some friends that seemed to have some life in their and, and there's some excitement about the Lord. We said, what are you doing? And they told us that they had been to a seminar taught by a man named Milton Green. And so my mother went and was greatly encouraged. She said, Terry, you have to go. A couple, a couple of months later, we attended. And it was at that seminar he taught on two topics. One of them was healing and how God healed and still heals today. It is his will to heal. And he took this Bible and he went from cover to cover, Old Testament through the New Testament, nearly every book, showing how God healed, how it was his will to heal. We would have said, oh, sure, God can heal you. No, sir, not God can heal you. Of course he can, but he wants to. It's his will to heal you. And I saw God open, like I said, he opened my eyes, lifted a veil, and I saw, I said, my God, my God, have mercy on me. The power of God is the same today as it was when Jesus walked on this earth or through the Old Testament, the apostles that came forth from Jesus' ministry. It's the same today as then. And then I thought, oh, Lord, how can I know anything else that I was taught that was wrong? Um, and uh, actually about a few months after that, my oldest son, Philip, he was only 18 months old at the time, and he got gravely ill with pneumonia. And um, I thought about this needing to believe God for healing, but I didn't know how. And I tell you, you can't have believed for 30 years that God doesn't heal as a regular regular uh, course of practice and then just start believing and have that work in you. You have these Amen. false foundations laid in your heart that he doesn't heal. And as much as you can want to believe that, those false foundations had to be torn down by the ministry of the prophet, torn down, thrown down, destroyed. So um, after I came here, um, I wanted to see the power of God work in my life. I wanted to see healing work. And here I heard you teach how in Isaiah 53, uh, he carried our sicknesses. He bore, he bore our pains. He carried, he bore them and he carried them in his body. Our sicknesses, if you look at those words in Isaiah, Isaiah 53, the words that are translated griefs and sorrows, those words are sickness and pain. Um, and he carried those, and I could, God opened my heart to understand. Just like he carried sins in his body, when he was raised from the dead, those sins were forgiven. He carried your sicknesses on his body, and when he was raised from the dead, he was healed, we were healed with him. Well, why are we sick? Well, your sins aren't forgiven until you know to believe. Likewise, you have to believe your, you, your sickness was carried on the cross. You have to believe that for that healing to manifest. But it's believing the gospel, not believing you're healed. And that was the critical thing Amen. that I learned. That's when healing started working in my life. Not believing I was healed, but believing the gospel and that in the gospel, that's where I was healed. And that's when it started working in my life, and I could pray for my children and see it work in, in them and heal them. What time is it? It's about 10.30, or 11.30, excuse me. <laughs> All right, I've got time for you to do a song. All right. And we'll have KD come up here and sit. All right. This is going to be fun doing these programs.
I got it back. Got it, do you want to come? saying goodbye, not knowing where I was going, but obeying God. By May of 70, sitting in my house, Springfield, Missouri, I had an apartment there, and I lived there part-time in Texas part-time. I said to the Lord, who do I get with? Who do I follow? Open the Bible. Just open it to John 15, verse 1, 2, 3. Would you read it? Sure will. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. In verse 4, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. I had a vision of a vine that May morning, a watermelon vine with watermelons. I thought, what is this? I never had a vision. I wasn't looking for one. I was a veterinarian. As I thought about this, I mean, it was before me, but 
but I couldn't, I could turn my head and be with Mormon. It didn't matter. It was in the spirit. As I thought about it, one of the watermelons turned into a cantaloupe. I thought for sure something's weird. Then a cucumber. Then a strawberry. I was just beside myself. I'm a sober man. Always have been. Sober thinking. Pretty stable on my feet. I hadn't seen anything like that. God showed me. The watermelon could represent cattle. Cantaloupe, Baptist. Cucumber, Methodist. Strawberries, Christian Church. Whoever heard of such a mess as I sat there on my chair, the Lord certainly said to me, the nominations are not of me. I was stunned. Stunned. Then the next was purge. Well, I'm shortening a lot of this. You can't talk for 40 over a period of 46 years and tell it in a few short meetings. We're going to be doing a lot of this. My friends, we are in, at the end time. We are living in the end time, the days that Jesus Christ is going to return. It won't be long. He'll be coming back. I'm talking about not, not very many years. Maybe seven, eight, maybe ten. He's coming. I don't think it'll go ten. Because I don't know. Only the Father knows. Jesus doesn't even know. So I'm not foolish enough to speculate. But purging, I was a veterinarian. Did a lot of equine work, a lot of horse work. A lot of baby bulls born. And I attended a lot of them. And I would give them mineral oil with a tube, nasal tube, down in their stomach. Uh, when they were just hours old, following four ounces of castor oil. And I watched them. Getting rid of the meconium. It hurt. That's a feces. That's in the intestinal tract. I watched them cramp with that gastro. I read that word, purge. Unless those babies passed it, they die. Or surgery. I preferred, I was not much with a knife. I liked doing it the other way. Some loved to cut. I didn't, or I would, but I'd, that was the last thing I'd do. Amazing. I read that word birds. I looked it up in Young, Strong's, whatever it was. I knew what it meant. I read Someone said, I, I'm not sure who I read it, that it meant to purge or to prune. They're not the same. They're not the same. I knew that I was headed for to be purged. I knew it could hurt. Sure enough, that's what that's happened. And Katie, if you'd read Hebrews 9, 14, I believe. All right. 
Hey, Beth, I'm going to let you talk when you get Oh, well, I'm fine. Up. <clears throat> I am fine. This is good. 9, uh, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? I read the Bible through twice before I ever obeyed God. I knew a lot of scripture. I studied Hebrews a lot, Romans a lot. God put me a holiday in in 1972 in Denton, Texas. Amen. Ten weeks studying Romans. I ended up during some time, during the first five chapters. By the time I got out of there, I had a pretty good understanding of Romans 1 through 5. That is where you got the, your revelation of the gospel. That's exactly right. Right. And there was no purging until you got that. That's right. Uh, you and I have talked a lot. Uh, about my life. I was talking to you this morning about a week that went by. And I told you I thought it was early 74. Right. It could have been. It could have been 73. But most likely 74. I had gone through a period whereby from my Adam's apple down to my diaphragm, I felt just hard, hard. It was difficult to eat, to eat food. About six month period to swallow. I didn't know what was going on. Not at all. I just thought it must be God. I'd been following what I thought was God. But the Holy Ghost, it hurt though all the time like I was full of something. And by chance, like I couldn't get rid of it. Uncomfortable, yes. I'm not sure of the sequence of everything, but I read where Saul, when God anointed Samuel, anointed. When he turned, I think, God gave him a new heart. Right. I said, Lord, give me a new heart. Does not it say in Ezekiel about taking out the stony heart and there replacing it with a heart of flesh? There you go. That might have been a stony heart was so hard. No, it wasn't. Then my, it was. <laughs> <laughs> hard, hard. Thank God for you. I know God's got two women up here. One baptized 84, I think, and you, Jerry, in 84, before she ever came to water blood, spoken tongues, and you in what? 1978. 78. Right. Or either one of you ever heard of me. Amen. Amazing. One day, that hardness started leaping. I was a man of much fear because 
under nobody that had experienced what I was experiencing. No preachers. I knew Kenneth Hagin not well. I knew Derek Prince real well. He didn't understand. No one did. One day, I was in early spring. I thought I was going to die. Gushes of power would come up in me. Gushes. And when they come up, I'm up like this. I couldn't, I mean, they raised me clear up off of my chair. And when they come, I thought, I'm, I'll, I will be all right. That was the Lord telling me, you're going to be all right. So I said to Pat, she said, she's been with me since 1952. She worked with me when I was a veterinarian, worked in my office. And I said, Pat, drive me to a horse farm. Maybe if I see a horse, I won't feel so bad. I couldn't sleep at night. Nobody understood me. There was no help. Just said the word. The Lord was Persian. Amen. I remember one day, it was a cold day. I said, let's go. Let's go to a horse farm. People I know that know me, some of them thought I'd gone crazy. And we started driving, and it's up would come the power. I'd say, Pat, here it comes. I'll be okay. Don't be afraid. Whatever you do, don't be afraid. I will not die. I will be all right. Here it comes. Gushes out of my heart. I don't think we ever got to the horse farm. I don't recall it. That went on for a solid week, not at the same interval. I don't think I could have stood it. But when it was over, that hardness was not there. Amen. I had peace like I never had. That was a gospel, called the gospel of peace, right? Amen. What time is it? Oh, it's 11.49. We're okay, huh? Oh, yeah. That was the mercy of God on the will. On you. I've said it. You don't know what I've been through. You know, Smith Wigglesworth wrote, said, spoke. Right. What? He said, some cannot stand the purging. They want the kingdom, but they cannot stand the purging. I've seen it. Yeah. Myself. God told me back in those days, you had never wanted but me to do this job. I kind of started believing after that week. I, I, I don't even know how there was that much stuff in me. <laughs> but that was a gospel. And, and then you talked about it was after that, that right. purging is when God showed you you were a hypocrite. Oh, God. <laughs> Katie, you're so sweet. You remember all this stuff. Huh? I do be, because... I needed to remember it. 
when I started walking through this. I okay. mean, your story, the reason, one of the reasons I know your story so well and they're in my heart was I was going through some of this stuff when, when you were telling them and I would hang on to them and, and they ministered peace to me, faith to me. And I hung on to him, and when things like this happened, I'd say, okay, well, Doyle had this happen to him, and this is what's happening to me. I mean, they ministered faith to me. Because not only would you tell the stories, but you showed it in the Word. That was 74. All right. <laughs> I had a Bible study in my home. I started in the fall of 72. By 73, we had 25 35 people every Thursday night. And on uh, 74, early, I think that's when the purging took place and God showed me Matthew 7. Uh, was that verse 5 verses? Yeah, let me go to it. Would you read that? You know, God's purging me right now of more fear. Thank God. Matthew 7. You want me to begin in verse 1? Oh, well, I think that's where it yeah. begins. Judge not that you be not judged. For with judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, that considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. I was casting out devils. Had been about three years. And I said, I will not continue. I will not Continue. I'll shut this Bible study down now. I will not be a hypocrite preacher. And I'll shut it down. People, Zoyle, oh, there's nobody but you. Oh, yeah, and I'm the hypocrite. Don't think I'm going to preach and I'm a hypocrite. I just didn't want to be a hypocrite. I could read what happened to hypocrites. Amen. Would you read Luke 12, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, sure. 5? Luke 12, 1. In the meantime, there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch they trod one upon another. He began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after have no more they can do, but I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killeth, killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Leaven of the Pharisees is what? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. See, I was a, a good student. I could read. I was honest. As an honest heart and an honest intellect. I could see about hypocrites. I didn't want to be one. And I shut it, shut that Bible study down. People upset. Nobody can teach like you. Oh, I'm a hypocrite. Jesus said I was a hypocrite. You think I'm going to be preaching the gospel and be a hypocrite? I went through some tough times. Scary times. Really scary. I thought more than once I might not live a week or a day. And nobody to help. Nobody. 
I remember one day, and I, I did so much. I taught the First United Methodist Church, Argyle, on Saturday morning for six months, uh, a, a Bible study, about 50 or 60 men. They'd have breakfast, we would, and I'd teach them an hour. We have about four minutes. Okay. Uh, it's just amazing. I, I'm going to tell this story. One day, I went walking four miles around this quadrant, hot. My head hurt, hurt so bad. I thought, I'm going to die. My head's going to burst. And I walked it, and I came back. I walked into a house. There sat Pat Marlene Irvin. She was a choir director, Argyle United Methodist. I said, God, my head is about to burst. I can't take it anymore. And I fell on my face on hardwood floors. <laughs> and that spirit came out of my mind, out of my intellect. And it was sorcery. Sorcery. That you got. A lot more. Yeah. A lot more. I got it in church. Right. Folks, you don't know what has you bound. Only Jesus can tell you, help you. Thank God. We better shut her down, huh? It's 1158. Oh, just right. There's just one name. No other name under heaven. Whereby one must be saved. Just Jesus, Christ of Nazareth. No other name. Amen. No other name. Whereby what must be saved. You have the faith God is putting in your heart. All you have to do to be saved or born again or one with the Lord, speak the name of Jesus after me and you will be saved. Jesus, 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 We invite you to visit Water of Life Church at 1621 18th Street in Plano, Texas. Or for further information, call area code 972-578-8082. That's 972-578-8082. Or write Doyle Davidson, Post Office Box 861327, Plano, Texas 75086. That's Doyle Davidson, Post Office Box 861327, Plano, Texas 75086. This program was paid for by Water of Life Church.